Today, we've got two young men. I think of them as young men, although they're much older than I am. <laughs> but growing up with them, they are true Americans. They are representative of their families, grandfathers, fathers, mothers, and represent our community, our state, and our nation. And they've all served in the service. And I want to introduce you to Pete and Alan Simpson, our guests. Uh, I think we better get started, Mac. Let's roll into this thing. And uh, well, I'd just like to oh. remind everybody that we're talking about old timers. And unfortunately, the description of old timers now includes me. <laughs> so, okay. but I'm not quite as old as this character. <laughs> One other thing, we started with 300 names, then we cut it down to 96 names, then we cut it down to 45 to 35, then we increased it a few, and we may run over a little bit today, and there's even been talk right after the first of the year of chapter two. Uh, this is chapter one, but we need your feedback if you find it to be fun, interesting, uh, and guidance for what you want to see next year. We've scheduled the Thursdays for next year uh, as we've done this year. And uh, any feedback, send it to the museum or send it to me, and we'll add it to a gathering uh, the 7th of uh, December. and take this into the new year. But thank you for participating, and we'll have questions today also. Uh, and I turn it over. Uh, let's go to the next slide, and uh, it's in your hands. Do you recognize these four? Uh, I want you to know that the two ladies, the wives, are the power behind these two young men and their lives. I learned that from my wife. If it hadn't been for her, I wouldn't be here today. And thank you both. Oh, move. move on from that. Uh, Bob, I want to first uh, commend you and the Buffalo Bill for this series of local lore, which we have heard is so popular. And uh, we're proud to be a part of this portion of it, but you've done a whale of a job. So here's to you, Paul. Thank you. You were under, always underfoot, actually. You're just you're quite a you know, bit younger than we are, and, and you to say that your contemporary is just absurd. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, well, down there. But what? those are the wives. Uh, and they're here to watch. They're right in front of us, watching <laughs> carefully. And uh, I know that Ann said that living with me was like a religious experience, a living hell. <laughs> I don't know what Lynn said about it. <laughs> she just says, be careful. Um, and, uh, those, uh, I, I also want to acknowledge all of you. This is amazing. It's a snowy day, it's a cold day for superannuated guys like us. It's even hard to get out on a day like this. Now, I did see David Fike earlier, and I said, David, you knew what we were going to do, and you came anyway. <laughs> and you all have done that, and we're grateful for your presence and, and for this time to be with you. I want to make another uh, notation. There are people in this crowd, many of you, whose families, whose heritage, whose linkages with this community go way back. We can't mention everybody, but we are so proud of the legacy that you all represent, as well as your interest in what we're trying to do. So, so. Well, there are a lot of people in this audience and in this town that you're, you're, you're going to wonder, why didn't we mention him or her and it was just an impossible thing. We, uh, but anyway, this was, this is the, during the war, we were all riding bicycles, and there we are. 
uh, riding our Schwinn bicycles. And, uh, <laughs> and anyway, that's enough of that. But uh, <laughs> ah, here we go. They'll just keep slapping them up, and we'll start looking. Lloyd Taggart Sr., he was, he was a big power contractor here. Uh, his, uh, his family are all over the place. There were nine of them in high school, nine children of the, of the Taggart family. The last one was Ray Rita, who passed uh, about three or four months ago. And uh, he, was, he was a formidable man. He would throw us out of his home uh, we'd be down playing pool, and then uh, Louise would come down and offer us hot chocolate, and he would he would just insist that he was serious, but he was he was a soft touch. Well, Lynn knows this story, uh, and um, one of my first girlfriends was Ray Rita oh. Taggart. Oh, she was dynamite, and so. <laughs> And, 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 and Linda so said, you can say that and no more. <laughs> uh, next. <laughs> so we, I'd go to the door, and Lloyd Taggart would appear at the door, a formidable man, forceful man. Then I'd say, Mr. Taggart, uh, is Ray Rita here? And I would see her, I saw her walk through the dining room just behind him, and he said, no, she's not. And I said, well, Mr. Taggart, I think I just saw her walk through the dining room. He said, young man, when I say Ray Rita is not here, she is not here. <laughs> True. <laughs> Ooh. Oh, boy. Well, there's our pal. Uh, and uh, he was, a, he was, you've all heard the stories, but uh, during the war, he said he had a special mission and we all said, I wonder what that is, Anson, you know, and I'd fish through his property and I'd holler at him, you know, because I was a little frightened that he, I could startle him. And he had, he had hundreds of cats and I had <laughs> hundreds of fish. No, I didn't mean that. <laughs> and he'd, he'd jump off into my creel and then he'd, he'd uh, talk and he, he talked a lot, but uh, during the war, he was on a mission. He was looking for those balloons that they were putting in the theaters in Tokyo and sending on the Gulf Stream or on this to set the, set fire of the forests of the West in Idaho, Washington, Oregon, and that's he and he found several of those. Interesting guy. We thought he was lying, but he wasn't. <laughs> he lived right across, right down the Ishwa from where our <clears throat> where the Bobcat Ranch is. And uh, we were coming back from a fishing expedition. I would occasionally just go up to the falls, uh, take a nap, put beer in the river, and then when you get started, take a drink of beer and we did, fish uh, down until night and have some wonderful good luck. Well, any time we came close to Hanson's because he was a crack shot and he was also protective of his property. And uh, as we'd get close to Anson's place, Al would say, remember, don't get down on one knee. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, he was a oh. wonderful man. Oh, this guy. Well, you tell him about the high sheriff. That's what we called him. Yep, Frank Blackburn was sheriff here for as many years as it took up for us to grow up. And he taught swimming to my wife down here, to many of the, you people who would remember. He would teach swimming down at Damaris Hot Springs, down at the old Hot, uh, hot Springs pool, which had a structure around it. And, uh, and Lynn has always said that they would come home from swimming lessons or from swimming competitively. And, and smells too, so bad of sulfur that it was hard to walk down the halls of Cody High without having protest. And he would drink, he would drink a cup of And he of drank it. it. And yeah. get us up at six in the morning to take us out there to teach us swimming. We, we were not good tutors, I mean learners. No. We were bad. <laughs> well, I had hammer toes. I couldn't go ahead. But right. Anyhow, the... Uh, <laughs> But Frank was a was oriented toward kids, toward youth, 
and he was marvelous with the sheriff. I know there are probably some relatives here even today, and he married a delightful Scottish wife, Jenny. And so Jenny and our grandmother would get together and, and Nanny, our grandmother, would say, Jenny, what will, should we do today? And Jenny said, let's go visit the Geralds. So she had a group of six Geralds who would play bridge and be a part of a, of a little community of ladies. Well, he was the guy that was uh, missing when Earl Durand uh, escaped from jail, and uh, that was when the undersheriff uh, had been baited along by someone uh, in, in, in power and uh, hit Brett Riley over the head with it, and they called him Mount Bottle Riley. <laughs> that went through the years. Uh, but uh, Frank uh, also could recite the Masonic uh, uh, Rituals. Uh, Rituals. Of the code of the death at the at the graveyard. Oh yeah. And Dad said more people died waiting for Frank to give that in <laughs> <laughs> the cold. <laughs> And, uh, well, that's another story. All right, we he better did. keep moving on no, here. Yes, yes, no, yes. Oh, my God, there she is. Oh, there's a, there's a great, uh, this was our, the local madam in this town, all of you, I think, almost all of you know of Cassie's Place, which carries her name, where the bordello was in the old days. I'll never forget our grandmother saying, with great contempt, when she heard about Cassie, she said, Cassie ruined Bill Bennett's marriage. And Dad said, I wonder if Bill had anything to do with that. <laughs> 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 and and our, our grandfather was temporarily the, the city attorney for Cody, and they ran out of money. And they said, well, there's only one person in, in the town with money. So why don't you go see Cassie's? And he got 3,000 bucks so they could keep the wheels turning. <laughs> I do remember that. And there was a pistol and they engraved to her name and said, every inch a lady. Yeah. All right, That's right. We need to go on. That's right. Oh. Oh, great guy. Well, this is, a, this, is, this is a, an amazing thing. This is, we called him Lyle and Craig. We lived right across the alley from each other and both served uh, in, in high school and played football. Then both went to the University of Wyoming and played freshman football. He went into the Marines. And then we both went to the U.S. Senate. And uh, there hasn't been any story like that to, Two guys who grew, grew up, and he took. We went all too soon with him. Uh, he's buried here uh, uh, in, in Riverside. From a town of 2,600, we grew up in a town of 2,600 people, mm -hmm. and uh, he was a part of that town. So it is remarkable to have two guys, oh. two local guys. Oh. oh. Tell them about Louie and uh, Esther Williams. No, I don't <laughs> no. want to hear it. <laughs> you oh, did no. invite her out here, didn't you? Yes, yes, we did. I know. But uh, Louis, Louis was a neighbor. He lived right down uh, uh, Canyon Avenue, where my wife's parents later lived. And we would go to the Mayflower Cafe with uh, $2. The folks would send us down there because the Mayflower was kind of a babysitter at dinner time and order a, a breaded veal cutlets at the Mayflower Cafe. And old Louie was always at the counter and you could buy a, that kind of a meal for a dollar in those days, which was a lot. Well, Louie grew up with us. He became a really good athlete. He was small, but he was very fast. And he served in the Marines, passed away just recently. So, the, the lose and his uh, the building is gone in new hands uh, to uh, uh, relatives of uh, our wonderful friend out in Ralston, and they're going to refurbish uh, the old building. That's great. Uh, that's my what I've heard. Oh boy, there is a. Well, those are those are some of the powers of Cody. That's. Well, you, you, uh, Andy Martin, we've all heard of him, uh, Andy Martin Hill, Dwight Hollister, 
Uh, his wife was Orilla. She was the county clerk for 30 years, Hardy Shaw. Well, and Fred, you could add a touch to these four. Well, these are really. Hardy Shaw lived up right at the forest boundary, and according to my granddad, made the best whiskey in the country. <laughs> uh, and he was married to Fred Morris of uh, one of the guest ranches on the North Fork to his sister, or his wife's sister. But Hardy Shaw, when uh, Frank Blackburn would call Fred Richard and say, I've got to come up, I've had complaints about moonshining. And Granddad said, I'll have a couple of horses. And then somehow Hardy Shaw and the other moonshiners got word Frank was going to come up and check out uh, and see if any moonshining was going on. And after they made the circle and got back to his car to go back to town, he always had four or five bottles of the best moonshine in the country. And he says, that was a good trip. Can't give you a quart. <laughs> this, this is an era in Cody that has to be expanded on a little. Because the, when Dad came to town, some of his, as a young lawyer, some of his best clients were bootleggers out on Wyoming Avenue. And uh, one of them was a guy who had hard, was hard of hearing, who they called Deefy, Deefy Williams. And he was one of Dad's clients. Dad had to go to some other uh, meeting in Thermopolis, but his client was due to be arraigned in the court. So he called Deefy, he was, how's that? And this is Millward. Oh, who is it? Yeah, this is Millward, and you are I'm going to be gone, but you have to be arraigned. And when Sheriff Blackburn calls, you'll have to follow his instructions. Okay, Sim, which they called him. So during the time that Dad was gone, Frank called and said, uh, D.V., who's that? D.V., uh, this is Frank. Frank, this is, and it's time for you to come to court. It's your day in court. And D.V. said, well, I can't give you a court, but I can give you a couple of lines. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's true. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. He lost that case. <laughs> This was uh, the editor of the Cody Enterprise. This was uh, Peg Coe's father, and he was a member of the legislature. And when he went down for the 40 days, he had this beautiful daughter, Ruthie, who was a little older than Peter and I were. And uh, my old man had the greatest time of his life. He had a daughter for 40 days, and she was, she was just a spectacular uh, and then there was there were the Ernie, there were Dick Shaw and Charles and anyway he, he drowned in uh, in the Yellowstone Lake uh, in a canoe uh, with the with the uh, brother of Mike Sullivan's sister. Uh, Ernie was Mike the... Mike Sol Mike Sol she was this was Jane and her her. Or Jane. Jane. Metzler. Metzler died Metzler. in the same accident. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Ernie was the kindest tempered guy, mild mannered, wonderful, great with kids. Alan, at the age of six, got pneumonia. And the doctors came to the house then Doc Ridgeway, Doc Dominic, Doc Jones, the, all these four doctors who formed the clinic. Well, they came to the house and they built a tent around my brother in the back room of the house, and I wasn't supposed to stay there. And Ernie took me in, in this guy, and, and taught me how to eat mulligan stew. <laughs> and he, he, was, he was such a kindly guy. So while Dad had a daughter for a while, Ernie had another son. <laughs> yeah, that's true. All right, moving on. Well, there's, uh, this, is, this is Bob's father and his uncle, but and this appears because there's some photos here, but this guy, he looks like central casting. That was Bob Richard. He was a general. 
He retired as a general. general. Yeah, he was a Marine naval aviator and he started in Guadalcanal. He'd come back from combat and tell Peter and I stories of of the war that were that etched in my mind forever, but he was a magnificent man. He was exactly. our idol. Our idol. He really he was. was. <laughs> yeah. My grandmother, their mother, sent him back to Hill School to get a little cooth trained into them and teach them manners. And they were back there for a couple of years each and then came back and finished high school here. But the grandmother being a school teacher from Chicago felt that they needed a little cleaning up on the edges before they went to college. <laughs> Next. Oh, well, there's a, oh, boy. these are the two people that started the Cody Country Art League. Dear people, Polly and Jess Frost, that's Matt's parents. And uh, he had some serious uh, debilitating things in, in the past and she, within a few weeks joined him. But they started uh, big time, the Cody Country Art League, and they were both talented artists uh, and uh, just uh, a joy to be around. They were, they were very popular people. And Jess was a historian, too. Yes, he was. He knew the past of this town. And of oh, Wyoming. there is a... And he was a... Now, there is... Oh, boy. That's a little something up at the uh, Bobcat Ranch, and there's some, this is a good tea. See why Keith Thompson with his cigarette and Dick Frost with his cigarette, they, went, they were both gone. Uh, this, the, the, on my side, is Keith Thompson, who was the U.S. Congressman. He ran for the U.S. Senate and won and died before he was sworn in. And that's when Joe Hickey appointed himself to the U.S. Senate. The next to him is Dick Frost, the great historian of all of us. And of course, the old man himself, here's Bob Woodruff, who owned the TE. And then this cat in the suit, it was the Secretary of Interior. And the cat with the white coat is Bob. And then Glenn Nielsen, right here, to the second one. And Larry Larum, the owner of the, of the Valley Ranch. But, that was a big do up the river, uh, entertaining. That's not the Secretary of Interior that uh, got into trouble with some jokes. I remember yeah, that. I don't was remember. <laughs> <laughs> could have been. It, well, it could have been. Oh, gee. Oh, well, there's, I mean, you, you've got to tell them. You, to see them together is just <laughs> sick. <laughs> he was, Katie he, Brown and Bill Waller. Bill Waller. That's right. He was uh, an ineffable and constant influence on a whole army of boys in this town. He was our football coach. In fact, I made a little talk to the high school one day and I said, I visited your football coach and his staff, your basketball coach and his staff, your wrestling coach and your PE instructor. When I went to school, they were all the same guy. And that was Bill Waller, he taught all of that. And he'd run us for a mile. He'd, he'd make us, we, did, we actually walked for a mile. But Katie Brown was still leading the 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 can-can girls on the top of the, uh, she didn't look quite like that, but she was a slim, <laughs> slim person. And uh, how they ever got them in the same picture is beyond me. <laughs> but they, <laughs> they were crazy about each other, they were, yes, they even were. Late, later in life. Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. He was originally married to Miss Texas, and he had been a pro football player at 170 pounds. He played for the Chicago Bears, okay. he played for George Hallis, and he played for Bob Zupke at Illinois. So he had a great background in athletics, and he literally started the wrestling programs in the state of Wyoming, which led to the wrestling program at the University of Wyoming. And the first of those teams had seven Cody kids on University Wrestling. And seven championships yeah. in one world. One of them was Dick Ballinger, who became an NCAA uh, weight. That was his weight in the, in the entire NCAA. And Waller also, there was another, there are two guys from Cody High who won the NCAA heavy all the top, and one was Bob Rank, 
who was the national heavyweight champion at Wisconsin, and Dick Ballinger to the University of Wyoming, two guys from Cody High. I'm going to get a get a picture of them and let kids know that there were two two big guys in the in the NCAA, yeah. top of the top of the pile. Okay. Next, well, enough of that. There he is. There he is. He's the old pro. We don't know. We were that the the woman to his. If someone can identify that woman to the left, that's his daughter, I, and I, and she was married to someone, and, and I believe it was Mrs. Newton. Yeah. I can't if anybody can help us with names yes. here, we'd love to have them. Yeah, the uh, we think is the one on the right. I think is his mother, but we're not sure. There okay. are lots of Newtons around town, and they, of course the old. Uh, nearby ranch with Bev and Don Kurtz out there. And uh, so it's, it's a, it's, the strain is still here, but okay. I don't know. We'll move on. Well, here's Dave Jones. We used to shoot at his signs. No. <laughs> well, they were impervious to a, to a 22 short. You, you had to use a 22 long rifle. Well, a lot of them are around, but they're in terrible shape. But there he is, Dave Jones, and his sign is on the back of the building, right behind the... Yeah, yeah. Well, By the of Dave Postal. Jones. Yeah. That's Jim Shepard. I worked for Jim Shepard in his clothing store with Bill Lilly. Lilly and Shepard, they were post-war Cody citizens, and part of the building of this town. And uh, I would swamp out in the store, and I also seen <coughs> the transoms, which were up above the window, because I had grown six inches in one year. So when I was 15 years old, I could reach the transom. Well, there was a barber across the street called Kurt Howe, and he was right where the uh, old uh, Yellowstone gift uh, building is. And he said, I'm going to arrange a little money making proposition with you, kid. He said, it, when you call me and tell me when you're going to go out and clean the transom. And if there are enough cars parked, I'm going to bet the guy in the chair that you're not standing on a box. And I said, you think we can make it? So let's try. So he would bet two bits. I don't think that kid's standing on a box. And they'd wait and he'd be cutting the air and the car would move out. Sure enough, I was standing on my own two legs. I made. 75 cents. <laughs> and I think Hal took a cut. <laughs> well, I tell you, the other one was uh, the most formidable superintendent of schools has ever been here, Frank Krause. He lived in that little southwest house right across from the parking lot uh, at Winona Thompson. Another, that's another story. We didn't know he was a professional boxer. And uh, but look at it, he was a lightweight something, and Jerry Lansbury found that out <laughs> because Jerry was, well, I think, was I don't know what Jerry was doing, but he was one of our dear pals, but uh, and with us, yeah, and the, the old cowboy preacher. But anyway, uh, Frank punched him up, and uh, later we had another principal who punched up Clell Wynn and Charlie Wynn. And part of, Charlie took him on, and we all cheered because they beat him <laughs> out, out on, the, on the lawn. I, those were different days in the school. <laughs> no one, one, okay. one short story about Frank Krause. He was a boxer, but he would take you into the office if you'd been misbehaving, and misbehaving was throwing a gun at somebody or you know, not carrying a gun or something. And he would say, you need to straighten up. And he'd take this finger, his index finger, and here, there, and it felt like a full-blown punch from a guy who could buck. I'll never forget that. No, I could. <laughs> <laughs> you had more holes in your... Than... Now, there he is. There he if is. You, any saw the movie, Man the Painted Horse, he was the hero, George Inma, but to us, we didn't know that. He was just the guy that was just west of the Murma, and he had a gun gunsmith, and he he the sign said gunsmith. He had misspelled the sign, gunsmith, and he was he was 
oh, he was a uh, very hardy guy. He, he was he was packing lumber too, but he had terrible uh, mark marks on his skin and like a skin cancers. But he was awfully good to us. But he would show us how to how to blacksmith. That's what he did. And blue blue guns. He knew how to blue gun. And he was the hero of that movie, if you ever saw that. We did see it. Yeah. I think and on 14th Street, I think Bragg where that yeah. gun store is now. Gunsmith. George and Gunsmith. He was a handsome cap in his day. There he is. Mm, right. Next one. There we go. Oh, there. Well, there's Fred Garlow. Pete and I worked for Fred at the B4 Ranch. We were 14 and 15. And uh, we didn't have a driver's license, but Freddie didn't care about that. Uh, it was just that we could drive him into Hoosier's Bar <laughs> in Cook City and get him home. <laughs> and uh, and uh, then Peg would uh, rain on his head, and it's a different story. But there was Cliff Hansen, uh, Governor of Wyoming and U.S. Senator, and, and his beautiful wife, uh, Martha. And there they were at the I think that was the 75th anniversary of statehood, but those were those were classy Fred, people. Fred, uh, Fred, uh, Dad said you guys have to learn how to work in the summertime. And I worked. He says I worked for a dollar a day. Then he said you're going up to Fred Carlos, working at the B4, and he's going to pay you a dollar a day. And he did. In the meantime, we high centered his truck, we, we dried up his cow, we, we had this. Drowned out his and, rats. And, yeah. yeah, that's right. Well, and no to, to this well. day, sure, the dad paid him to pay us. <laughs> uh -oh. Now, this this is a people have forgotten. There, there are lots of grievers around here. But this man was a Democrat, and he was in, elected to the U.S. Congress, Paul Griever. He died tragically uh, uh, in a hunting situation. His wife, Ada, there she is, classy lady. She would drive, when she was 85, she would drive back and forth to Mexico in, in, from in, when the snows would come. And uh, they, they had, their cabin, I think, is still owned by the family up there. But he was, uh, he was a, 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 a powerhouse. He was a, a very articulate, uh, smart guy, and, and his family are, are all around. He also was involved in the Heart Mountain Canal and the siphon and getting water over the Heart Mountain before the war. Next. Well, there are some of your cats for the streets were named after. Uh, I can imagine. And there's Governor Beck uh, on the right in the front. And then Bronson Rumsey, that was the father of Bob Rumsey. Garens, a pretty short street up on there, Garen Street in Bleistein, who was from Buffalo, New York. Yeah. And he did the Colonel's uh, posters. And, and there, were, there were people who were of the Jewish faith who, who found that, that the colonel was very close to this man, Bleistein. And of course, the streets were named after him. And there's just a small uh, stone uh, at that very famous uh, cemetery in Buffalo. Uh, but. Uh, those were the those were the founding fathers of, of, of Cody. Unless you can add a, I didn't. Well, Bob Rumsey we knew, but uh, the other and George Beck, though he was smoked that cigar and pulled a little whiskey there and just get terrified, ter ter <laughs> terrified. And I think Bob comes up next. Bob's yes. Yes. Son. Yes. Oh, there he is, Bob Rumsey. <clears throat> he was, uh, what do you can tell Bob, Bob? He lived up North Fork, had a cabin filled with first editions, original books of, of famous people. 
He loved H.L. Uh, Mencken. Some of you may have heard of H.L. Mencken and uh, the great satirist and uh, lyricist. And, uh, but Bob uh, would go into the Elks Club and have a little claret on Saturday and play Jim Rummy and uh, also some uh, crib. He had a tough divorce. Oh, that was this wife, and uh, we n I never knew her. No. But the arguments could be heard all the way up and down the North Fork. <laughs> it was anywhere within 20 miles. And, uh, and the divorce was so nasty that uh, Bob never talked about it. But he did commemorate her because the ranch that you see as you go up the North Fork is the UXU, the X is for bitch. <laughs> the four, the four service did not go for that. You bitch you. And, uh, and I said, you got to clean that up. <laughs> well, I think he did. But, uh, but that's uh, how you got it. And he has two beautiful sons. I think one of them still living. And uh, uh, Jimmy and uh, Rodson. Bronson. Mm -hmm. Anyway, he's out in front of the Frost Curio store. There he is with his tight pants on. We, we talk, this is going to divert a little bit here because each time we talk a bit about how they liked their claret or how they drank their whiskey or how homemade whiskey was good for you. There was a guy who's not on our list, but I think people have heard about him. Ed Phonograph Jones. Oh, yeah. And Phonograph Jones was a colorful, wonderful character who loved to talk, who was entertaining as the devil, who was a whale of a camp cook and a wrangler of perfect first prominence. <clears throat> and uh, I'll never forget going by the Irma Hotel one time, a group of dudes had gathered around uh, Phonograph asking him questions, and one of them said, Well, now, Mr. Jones, were you here during Prohibition? He said, I'm 86 years old. I sure was that I was here during Prohibition. He said, well, what did you think of Prohibition? And he said, well, it was better than no whiskey at all. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that. That was a classic statement. Oh, there we are. Buzz Buzzwell. Now, he... He was head of the Presbyterian Church for, I don't know, a lot of years. But it was, it was after he had left the church and, and died that people would come for 10 or 20 years. I wanted to get married by Buswell, or I want to be buried by Buswell. Well, he's gone. He's not here anymore. Anyway, he and Bill Waller and uh, Barney Goff, uh, uh, had some great poker sessions with the Boy Scouts. So they were they were leaders of us. But then, of course, as he left the scene, the old cowboy preacher came along after him with Jerry Lansbury, and uh, and uh, went to all of the churches. No, not the churches, the hospitals to see people. And he's still with us. And uh, but that said, that Buzz was, well, he married you, didn't he? Well, we were, Lynn and I were lucky enough to be married by Buzzwell. Um, and Lynn was a Presbyterian. I was able to convert her. <laughs> we all went to the Presbyterian Church in a lot of ways because he was literally the community's preacher. And so Lynn and I were to be married in the new Presbyterian Church up on the hill. The old one was a the fancy rock, a stolid old building in which the scouts met in the basement. And they did. Mm -hmm. And so when we got in, I can remember kneeling at the altar with my bride-to-be. And Buzzy had been out mowing the grass. We didn't have anybody mowing the grass that day, and he had a pair of tennis shoes and some white pants that sucked down below his cussing. And they were covered with green grass. <laughs> and I remember it eased my mind to see that the minister was not quite into the business as he should have been. I was, however. 
but it was heartening to see that there was some there's some cracks in the great man in the process of doing that. What a marvelous guy. Buzzy Buzzwell. Yep. There he is. Well, this is an informal portrait of Marge and Dick Wilder. Uh, Marge may be here. Is she? No, I hadn't seen her. I don't see her. She is. She's the one that start. She and Dick started the Wyoming well, Cody Her Heritage. Cody Cody Heritage Museum. That was just a little flame in my throat. <laughs> yeah. Now there they are, and uh, there are other pictures of them. But we decided that that was, well, he, was, he looks like he's crazy about her, and he was. And he was part of the firemen, uh, along with so many others, uh, Al Livingston, Glenn Livingston, and one that we'll get to one of those, but they, she started uh, the, uh, the uh, Cody Heritage Museum. He's very active with it now. Yes. Go on. Trade new bikes. Sorry, I beg your pardon. What's wrong with mine? They told me to do that. It's not my fault. <laughs> Have you covered this? Yeah. Yes. Well, next one. Oh. Okay. Anyway, I mean, they're drinking Fleshman, so there. That's really that could eat your throat out. <laughs> it was about six bucks a bottle, if I recall. Well, Dick, enough of that. Dick uh, Wilder, there were three persons. Uh, Dick Wilder ran the Cody Drug. Western Drug was run by Jim Indorf. All of them gone now. And Quinn Blair ran Blair Drug. All of the uh, boys went to Blair Drug because Ray Reed and Betty Clevenger and Elaine Cathcart all worked there as secretaries. <laughs> all the girls went to the Western Drug because Bob Bourne, Chip Chambers, and Donnie Kramer worked at the Western Drug. <laughs> so they had a nifty way of being with all the high school kids. But and high school kids went to work at those places and at the filling stations, uh, Walt Hoffman's station and Sinclair went under uh, Leclerc. So you, you went to work in the summertime. Most kids did, and uh, he was one of the great employers yep. and great guys. Great founders. Mm -hmm. We're going to move on. Yes, yeah, like we can tell that you're, you're going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, there we go. Oh, <laughs> boy, there's the trio. Uh, well, there's Carolyn Lockhart with the hat and the glasses looking to, to our left. And Vern Spencer, who was kind of, uh, well, he was a companion of Carolyn and, and kind of took care of her in later life. And then Arilla Hollister, who, who you saw her husband, she was the clerk for, I don't know, 30, 30 years. And, and Vern Spencer was, he was always telling some great stories of Cody. And of course, many of the ones were about Carolyn Lockhart, but Vernon also had a, it was a strange thing. He, he, he remembered where, where his mother had died on the bed and he left the indentation on the pillow and would show me that. I said, well, I, I really never seen anything like that. Uh, he said, well, that mother died right there. I said, well, I, I'm sure she did. She, <laughs> you know, those are the things you just walk out the door and think, where, where have I been? <laughs> but anyway, he was a great, great guy. And, and Carolyn would live forever. She took on everybody in the town. And she was older then. And she lived right there by the Eagles lot in a house. Well, the house got moved around. It's still going somewhere. Well, and, and, to and Carolyn was a notable author. And the book Lady Doc about our local uh, Dr. Lane, who is another story. But that book is still in print and uh, a wonderful read if you get a chance to read it. She was a good writer. And we can tell you who the characters are <laughs> yeah. that were made fun of in the book uh, because she was covering it up, but she really wasn't. I'm just uh, thinking about this again, a slight diversion, but Doc Lane was our doctor. Now, my doctor was a little kid, 
and among all the doctors who came to your house. This time I had to go to Doc Blaine's office. And uh, so she was about to put on a, a cup that I had uh, gotten in the garage, some mercuricone. And uh, my mother said, oh, Francis, I think Pete is allergic to mercuricone. Oh, she says, well, just a minute. So she went back and hauled out a file, and it said, don't give him mercuricone. And she said, well, damn it. And I was six years old, and I was impressed. <laughs> the first time I heard a cuss word, and I thought that was bad. And I'm sure that this one could wait uh, for another time, another session, but Dr. Lane, our doctor, and uh, a lot of the cowboys were a little, you know, they were spooked by her, but one old cat down at the log cabin, he, he, he presented himself with his member, and he said, I'll bet I can get Dr. Lane to, to take a look at that. <laughs> so he, Wandered into her office and unshocked his shorts there and said, uh, ain't that a dandy? And she went over to her desk and filled out a, a bill for 50 bucks, says, ain't that a dandy? <laughs> Harley, he was, boy, he was the high sheriff after Frank came after Frank. and probably served as long as, and there are lots of kinskins around here too, and boy, great, what a great family, but he was very dear to our father, and, and uh, he was, uh, he was a horse guy and uh, carry, you know, anything, but, but he was just part of Cody, he was just, Everybody loved him. He was a fair guy. If, if he was going to take you in, he'd kind of give you a cup of coffee. <laughs> Except for Anson and Eddie. <laughs> no, that's another story. <laughs> okay, I'll keep this here. Wow. Well, now, there's a book. In fact, Saturday, they're having a, a two thing. Of, yeah, 2 o'clock about the... Uh, Cody Volunteer Fire Department, nothing like it in the world, but there, there are some of the guys, who, Roy Holm, his family around, and Gerald Goddard Holm, Lloyd Evans, Jerry Evans was his, his dad, Rube LeClaire, and here, Bill Lieb was Mayor Cody, Max Thompson was the husband of Winona Thompson, he's the second one next to the guy that code, and Carl, who was that, Carl Bear? And then John Vogel, and that was the Vogel building down there. It's still there, you know. Vogel in German means bird, and those owls on the top of the building are still there. Uh, and John was an old German, and he said he was the mortician too. He said, but a lot of people are. He said a lot to my dad, uh, our dad. A lot of people are. Are not getting buried like they're they're taking them up to to uh, Billings and putting them in a the urine. <laughs> and my dad said, "Well, I don't think I, that couldn't be true, Joe." So anyway, he he was caught up with uh, with uh, modern technology, but he yeah, and the and the birds, the, the owls had lights. You slid a cylinder in there with a light bulb and a battery and when we had air raid warnings and boy we were we had blackouts in 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 the 40s when the war started but somebody left the owls the lights on on the owls so they have been penetrated by by armaments 22 long, 22 long <laughs> from, from the bar across the street was to say, well, that'll put them out, and, and it did. And it did. That, that fire department, that's oh. a tradition in this town. Yeah. I'm sure out here there are some relatives or descendants or people who have served in Cody's volunteer oh. fire department. Lives that? I did. I did 13 years. Uh, yeah. There are many, many people, and, and, and thanks, Evan, it, it's 
active and, and uh, young people are joining it and keeping it going and it's the cheapest investment we ever had because some of the fire departments in Cheyenne and Sheridan and Casper are going broke because you can retire at 42 and these guys, we'd work till 60 or anyway, it's a different game. Right, and, and they gave us good equipment. Lynn's dad was chief of the fire department for one year okay. and had to get a new fire truck. And I think Lynn was nine, something like, how old were you? He took her to Chicago, Illinois to pick up a fire truck. First time Lynn had been west of Matici, <laughs> east of Matici. And so, and, and I'll never forget Al telling those stories when I was about to get married. You know, she's a game girl. She went all the way to Chicago. I said, well, she's going to have to go a long way with me. <laughs> and she has, thank God. Okay, we better move along. Oh, yeah. Well, there's a pair that uh, she was involved with swimming with generations of young people, Ursula, and Kep was the sole trustee of the estate of Paul Stock. And uh, if you look around this community, you're going to see a lot of stuff that was done by Paul Stock. And it was all done through the trust that, uh, and he was my partner for about 18 years, through the trust that Paul had in Kev. And they did something that was unheard of. They, they took care of a full scholarship for Batizzi, Powell, and uh, Cody. Uh, uh, with the, with with the appropriate grade average, and just wrote that check for years years of time, and then did these approaches to the city and make them beautiful and you know grass and trees. Anyway, he was a great guy. Too 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 many times do I remember that. But she was she was a formidable. And the very head of the Girl Scouts, too, very big time. Not Ursula, there. I gave her her 50-year pin as a volunteer for Red Cross. Uh, amazing. But she taught swimming. She was the head of the Red Cross here till she said, Bob, I'm tired. And we found a young volunteer to take her place, but she still kept her finger right on top of it. Mm -hmm. Next. Well, there's the old pro of the mountains right there, William Robertson Cole of Cole Lodge and, uh, and the hospital, started the first hospital, and then Edward V. Robertson, who was English, and he was elected to the U.S. Senate one term, and I don't know who the other person is, but uh, there was, they, they traded land up there and the hoodoo and all sorts of things. There was blood is thicker than water, but it's thinner than money. <laughs> and they fought a lot about that. I don't know who won, but anyway, it was quite a thing. Um, if he married a oh my God, he's telling about old kid Nichols. God, look at that, that cigar. Telling about old Nick. He was uh, he was a wrestler. He was, uh, he was a wrestler. Our dad loved to box, and he was pretty good. And as a 14-year-old kid, he fought on the card that Kid Nichols was the chief of attraction, uh, a wrestler, wrestling card. But they had preliminary fights, and so dad would be on that same card. Kid is, is a marvelous figure. In fact, if we started telling the whole story, yeah. Well, and his, you know, his, his son is uh, our dear guy that uh, he lost his wife over the last year, uh, Nick, and uh, but anyway, he uh, he drank olive oil or mineral oil during the day, so it would come out through his pores, and then when he wrestled, he he was a little slicker than, <laughs> than the other guys. And that's, that's, that was part of his, but no, that's a true story, but he was the kid. And of course, there's wonderful 
parts of of that family around. But he he started plywood. He 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 hit he hit it. Car, you know, plyboard. Well, I have an expert back here, Jim Nichols, uh, kid's son, is sitting back here at about the fourth row, oh, well. and he wants everybody to know he's here. <laughs> oh, I he can he's here all day. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for coming, Jim. My pleasure. I keep doing this. Anyway, he was he was and Lucille, his little wife, and then two beautiful daughters that we were crazy about, Lucille and Barbara. Great stories of, of that. You could sell a book with those. Lucille, you know? the younger, wrote a terrific book about her dad called The Candy Kid. And uh, in it, there were some of the stories related to how he. Oh, there's so many. But he shot an elk out in the Yellowstone Park. This is early in his life, in his career here. And the park was. When, organized with troopers, not with rangers. There, there were army guys who were in the Soldiers. Park. Soldiers. And uh, he was confronted by them dragging the elk out of the park. He didn't think he'd shot it in the park. And in the process, this one young soldier uh, had his gun pointed at the kid, and the kid had said something in the neighborhood, and Jim would confirm or not, that uh, you're not going to shoot and I'm going to take my elk. And this kid did shoot and wounded Nick, and he went all the way down to North Fork, finally got to Mary Riddle's place, and when he was in Mary Riddle's place, she hit him, knowing that he was wounded. And uh, the troopers came, and she you know, fronted him at the store, at the door, and the kid fainted in the back of the pantry, and the Pots all fell down, and Mary said, that damn cat. <laughs> <laughs> and he never forgot that. The town protected him, Dog uh, Dan and Dog Trubla. Dog Trubla took care of him. And when he left town, he finally went into this situation where he could use insurance money to start veneer cut lumber, which is plywood, and ended up with some half a dozen or more mills all around the, the world. He had never forgot the town. Came back, set up his housekeeping, set up his family, and returned lots of large ass. And his, his daughter family. wrote the book "Best Little D Dam Best Little uh, Dam Like Town Like a, well, a Dam Site." Anyway, enough of that. We're but there, have to keep no, going yeah. next. Well, you you were in charge. What the hell? <laughs> I wish. Now there, Peter, you this, this this guy was the mayor of Cody in and out for years. His son, uh, Warren, and Bob Moore started the Oliver Glen course up there. That, that The whole development was done by Bob Moore. That's another great story of, of that guy. Uh, and uh, Warren Cowago. And uh, his wife was a very staunch Methodist, but Tom was not. Uh, <laughs> he, he had a ritual uh, at Frenchie's. Uh, you just put a little shot at the end of the bar uh, with a with a glass, and Tom would come in and surreptitiously look around and go, and then he'd leave and put a fifty cents right there and uh, be out in the community uh, helping people. Uh, anyway, he was bigger than life, and uh, and and his family are still around. Well, you could, he, he was, he, oh, oh, there's the old pro, oh, the old bushy brows, bushy brows, bushy brows, Paul Stock. Back in the old days of the Brewery Minstrel shows, there was one show that had the Irma Hotel as a backdrop, and up in the Irma Hotel window was somebody leaning out, and one of the lines in the Minstrel show was, Who's who's that up there in those windows with those two push brooms? And the other guy says, "No, not push brooms. Them is Paul Stock's eyebrows." <laughs> those are bad things. But he uh, he he failed and f would come back and fail and come back. 
but when he when he when he got out he was the largest individual shareholder of Texaco stock and that's where the that's where the bucks came from for years in this community there is no one more financially responsible for the big bucks that came through Paul and, and Kepler. That was big time. Just a quick story. I got a letter from my dad when I was in Southeast Asia uh, out of Quignon, and he said, Bob, your Uncle Will, my grandfather's brother, and Paul Stock were hunting tigers in Quignon in Southeast Asia back in the 30s. And they both got black fever, ended up in Hong Kong, and the guy was going to shoot my Uncle Will and leave him because they don't heal from it, but they made it. And ended up leaving Hong Kong and got back to Cody safe and sound. But that was an early day hunting trip. <laughs> Probably Moonshine that got him through the hole. Yeah, sure he did. Yes. Oh, well, there you go. Oh, this is a. This is taken uh, at the house. The Diamond Bar. The Diamond Bar Ranch. Uh, it, it, yeah. The Diamond Bar, which was Nick's place. Here's Paul Stock over here. Here's Nick dealing. Here's Frank Blackburn, the sheriff. Here's Tom Molesworth, the great artisan. This was a guy named Sweet Johnson. Sweet Johnson. He was a really great guy. And this is Ernie laughing, Ernie Shaw laughing at whoever's doing the dealing. But that was a, that was a way to spend a, a whole weekend <laughs> at Nick's place. Uh, it was a good good time. It's had by all of them. There, there weren't any city fireworks at that time. And Nick would stage a firework display on the 4th of July. Everybody drive up to the hill over the Diamond Bar and watch fireworks, all of it funded by yeah, you want to talk about Bud or no? Oh, but there he is. He's got his World War. He, he still got it in that Quonset out there. That's a World War II anti anti aircraft searchlight. And I don't know if Bud got it, but Bud would get a lot of things. And it was, it was, he was he was bigger than life. There he is. And what was called the. End of the Clark's Fork Road. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yes. He was going to have a road. Well, he he did. He pushed for it. You could you can see it up there and take it through the Clark's Fork Canyon <coughs> up in the sunlight. Because he was head of the highway commission from this area. He, he never stopped. And um, they and put blood in the Hall of Fame, the Business College Hall of Fame at the University of Wyoming. He said, but responded to it and, and all he said was I've been in business for 65 years and I ain't mad at nobody <laughs> and, and one of his compatriots said there are a couple of people mad at you but <laughs> he'd draw you up a ticket you'd buy a car and he'd say Al if I've made a mistake here I'm, I'm just not going to sleep at night I said just sign it give it just Forget the tap dance and all this stuff. <laughs> he said, I like to do that. <laughs> so I, 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 yeah, you have rebate. Yeah. Anyway, I lots of stories about on. Yeah, now we must. Oh, well, there you are. Mary Jester Allen, who was the founder of the feast. Yeah. She set up the, the building here, which was founded, you know, made about on the TE. And that was the Cody Chamber, and this is Pearl Newell. But she was the pearl of great price. Uh, and there they are, and they are two of the greatest, lovely ladies. And they really, they really. She ran the Irma, and Mary Jester ran the Buffalo Bill. And you, Exactly. We rode the two-legged calf. I know there were two-headed calf. Two -headed calf. Well, you, you shouldn't yeah. have had a two-legged, a two-headed calf in the museum. Yeah. And when we rode it, it, it fell off. <laughs> <laughs> but other people said, 
Oh, Mrs. Simpson's playing the piano while his, her boys are back there and said, well, somebody ought to pay attention. <laughs> enough of that, enough of that. It's like, when we came back to Down Allen in the 1990s, uh, we visited an old neighbor, he's not on the list here, but he was a great guy, he ran the Cody Sporting Goods store. And his name was Bill Waltz. He was clever and a witty guy. We went to visit him when we both came back to town. He said, Bill, we're here. We've lived just down the alley from you all these years, but we're back. And he said, I see where you two Simpson boys have returned to the scene of the crime. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's the guy that, that made this place. Goff was the chairman of the board for 30 years. And Dick Frost was curator, historian, everything. And they were, they, 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 it's a good one. I don't know what the date is. It's probably the Plains Indian Museum, but without those two people, uh, and Peg, and other people, it was, it was called How to Build a Western Museum with Eastern Money. That's the fire department calling, not calling me. We've got eight more people to talk about. It's one o'clock. I'd like to run over. If you need to go, you're certainly excused, but I'm going to insist these two stay here and get through the last eight names. Is that all right yeah. with everybody? Yeah. I think you guys are doing well. Uh, this, this one is uh, Mark Wilson. We left it here, but he died this morning. We went to the first grade together. And then we went off to the service. We went to Cranbrook School for a year. And we were just told this about two hours ago. And boy, I'm, I wasn't ready then. And I'm really not ready now. But that's where it is. Life goes on. It was uh, Glenn Nielsen and Husky Oil were a part of what created this town and built the foundation financially and entrepreneurially for lots and lots of people. And uh, I told Jim a story he had not remembered or not heard. I'll impart it again, but you see a picture of Ernest Goppert on the slide just before this one. Mm -hmm. Dad and Ernest Goppert were across the court from each other for 30 years, fighting cases against and with each other. And uh, Glenn, this young man, called up Dad at 2 o'clock in the morning. Dad didn't know who he was. He'd seen him on some affidavit related to a land deal. And he went into a pitch about, you know, I, I was praying, and your name came up. And I and I was my in my mind, if we could get people together in this community and enough money, we could buy that conical refinery out here on the edge of town, make it a local enterprise, and build a a, a future for this community. And he was so eloquent in that pitch that Dad, at the end of it, said, "Well, I can't find that much to gather from my clients, but." If you would call Gop, Ernie Goppert, and see what he says, don't tell him I told you to go. And so Glenn, at 3 o'clock in the morning, phoned up Gop and went into the same eloquent pitch. And Gop, at the end of it, said, I don't think, Mr. Nielsen, I can get that much out of my clientele, but if you'd call Millward Simpson, don't <laughs> tell him I told you to call. <laughs> and Duke, Duke picked up the, the money from old ranchers up Clark Fork. Some guy reached out to the four boards and pick up 200 bucks and give it to us. So there were a lot of husky stockholders in this town. And they, and they were given preferred stock yeah. uh, because they were the first rise and they really pulled it out from the mattress and they put the end of the package and bought Texaco out. Yeah. Two real Americans and the two presidents of Husky Oil and I, give a, I gave a talk on this last summer mm -hmm. on Husky Oil and it's 
in the archives, it's also online. We need to move on, uh, but again, uh-oh, this is very special. This is family. Well, we shouldn't have uh, done all this, uh, but there was the old man at his law office, which was above the Vogue shop. He was above the Vogue shop, uh, which is a different number. And there are, the, there are the relatives who were all in the service. There was Billy Brady, and then there was uh, Harry and Ed Amschel with their pictures, because Pop had been in World War I, but not in combat, and he wanted desperately to join, but he was 41 years old and they wouldn't take him. But he's sitting in his office, but you're, you're not looking at the curtain because he had a fire escape down there. He could go through there and call his loyal secretary, Anna Sue, and say, tell him I'm not here. And then he'd go through the curtain and end up right down by the Dave Jones. <laughs> dry cleaners. Yes, by the dry cleaners, where he took a lot of people to the cleaners. <laughs> right, let's move on. No, he has must one comment. Doing under office here, and in the process, Dad's secretary was Anna Sue Rector, mm -hmm. who was married to a Vanderhoff, and uh, he she saved his life legally oh, and God, yeah. in terms of the business every day. She was a remarkable guest. So hats off to her as well. Anna, yeah, so are you? Ah, there, Doc Chambers. Now, not, people really, that won't stir a lot of people, but let me tell you, he came here as a doctor of osteopathy, and they called him Doc Chambers. There wasn't a lot of osteopathy going on in the 30s and 40s. He had one son, Chink, we called him, Bill Chambers. But in the war, the, there was a lot of correspondence through V-mail, and the War Department showed up because people would write on the envelope, Hi, Doc. And the War Department came in here and said, What is this? Is this a code? Uh, you're, you're getting from the South Seas in Germany, Hi, Doc. He was just a, a, a great piano player and uh, had some of the most robust songs that any of us could ever recall. <laughs> about Lydia Pinkham's compound. <laughs> Next. How she served the human name. No, no. Now there, here's, here's a couple more. There's Bill also. There's Bill also. And there's Rex Van Der Van Van Paul. Dewey's dad. And Fritz Felsheim, and his dad was Red Felsheim, the bartender at that famous sign, scene that the that's Saturday the, night in Cody. Saturday night in Cody. Those guys on the boys' car. Oh, there they are. Right? And uh, uh, Rex was a flyer. Oh, and boy. served in World War II. The famous flyer here in town, Bill Mundy, who I'm sure you've talked about at some of these uh, new time meetings. I can remember Rex doing stunt, stunts over the town when I was a kid. And I thought, man, that is something special. Made me want to get into a plane. And then his uncle Dean, was Dean Vanderhoff. Yeah. Wonderful war hero, too. Yeah. And there's a great story about my old pal over there. Old, he's a good guy. Right there. We're going to have to keep going. Oh, okay. Well, enough of that. Peter, you can tell them where this is. It's right up at the TE. But the Teague Ranch, Henry Worm is the artist who painted that picture. Also, the artist featured in Bob uh, uh, Richard's book on Admiral Nimitz, because he was the formal Navy portrait or pro portrait artist, as well as combat artist. And the portrait of uh, Nimitz, Admiral Nimitz, was carried in Time Magazine, which was at Worm's. And Grigor's great friend was Tom Bosworth. Together, they actually designed some fabulous homes, the TE Ranch in particular. They did paintings for it. Tom designed all of the furniture and the carpeting with the uh, large Gina doll 
knitted into it. And those were, and you know, I was six, I was five. And Tom Molesworth's brand new factory, which is where the cancer center is now, burnt entirely to the ground but on the day it opened. Somebody had left some rags, some oily rags in a bad place and it combusted. And uh, I can remember a lot of us in grade school were sort of enlisted to go out and help with the cleanup. Mm -hmm. And the whole town cleaned it, cleaned it up, picked it up, and there was a long, long table, two of them, and the women of the town were cooking mm -hmm. hamburgers and feeding the people who were cleaning up the town. You don't forget that sort of thing from a community standpoint. And, nope. and people bought Tom's furniture, oh. little knowing that if they bought Tom's furniture, that might be worth something someday. <laughs> Sure. Well, this is yeah. the guy who, who, as our scoutmaster, and he said, you know, we're going to go out to the Jap camp. And we said, no, well, we're not, you know, I don't think so, because he got barbed wire out there and guard towers and searchlights and people with guns in the tower with the searchlights. And Glenn Livingston said, look, they're Boy Scouts. There are three troops out there, and we're going to go out there, and they're going to have a jamboree, they're going to tie in knots. And he was our scoutmaster, and he said, if any of your parents don't want you to go, why well, tell me? There was only one parent that, uh, that bowed out. And, uh, so Glenn was, uh, well, he was bigger than life. They made him to school after him, and his brother was big, big with, with the, high fire, the fire department. Alan Livingston, and that's Lynn's dad. But there he is, and Never Ian Buswell him. and Waller, and Barney Gall played a lot of cards. Mm -hmm. It didn't look like it. And I mean, Glenn, I'll never forget uh, Scoutmaster Glenn down in the basement of the Presbyterian Church when he told us about going out to the relocation center. He said, when you ask your parents, you tell them they swear the same oath they wear the same uniform, and they salute the same flag. And as Al says, only one parent uh, reneged on that. And that, of course, is where Al met Norm Manetta, and I met Luke Sakata, a little Japanese-American kid, who on a, the cold day that we were having the jamboree, we went outside to throw a football around, and Luke said, boy, it's so cold, my goose pimples got goose pimples. I thought, this guy's funnier than Bob Hope. That's <laughs> 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 true. Well, there, there he is, the, the dean of the Upper South Fork, that's the Valley Ranch, and that was Larry Larum. Uh, 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 and it was, a, it, was a, it was a pretty fancy place. Uh, and worked up there with the cabin girl. When I came back from Fort Lewis, I had had a real desperate time out there with old Olympia beer uh, and Rainier, and I looked like King Farouk. And I, I busted my Levi's and, and said, where have you been? I said, well, I've been in Fort Lewis. And he said, I think you weigh about 270 pounds. I said, no, 260. <laughs> but I could connect, get next to her and walk her wherever you know. <laughs> no, but anyway, you want to come with Larum. But Larum was a, a Princeton graduate. And he, was a, a, he had some money and he, he got this ranch. And people came from all over the world. The, the guest list was uh, uh, Jackie Bouvier, Kennedy. And, People all over the world. He had a roommate when he was going to school in Princeton by the name of Wayne Brooks. Yeah. And so he set up an on when he got this idea of buying this beautiful ranch at the end of South Fork. He uh, teamed up with uh, Wynn to form a partnership. And Wynn said, Well, you can office out of my store, which was Brooks Brothers yeah. in New York City. Yeah. So a lot of fancy folks were attracted to and to this day alumni of Valley Ranch will come back to see the place they get together sort of in reunions they have a legacy and a history that's both passionate and real it's been a fabulous addition to this country thank you we have
uh, achieved today a touch on some of the Americans and the Cody people that have had influence on us. And let's go to the next slide. Matt. I will get to it. Next slide. Well, while they're doing it, I can't resist this. I'm going to go back to the TV ranch. And one of Buffalo Bill's great foremen was a guy by the name of Evan Holman. Evan spoke in a very high voice, but he was a great trainer of draft horses. So a dude from the Belknap Ranch bought a brace of draft horses from Evan. And a week later, came back to Evan and was cursing. He was just smoking. He says, you lied to me. You dissembled. These horses won't pull. They won't pull the hat off my head. I can't get them to pull a damn thing. And Evan said, no, no. He said, I didn't tell you they'd pull. I told you to do your heart good to see them pull. <laughs> I remember <laughs> If, if you will bear with us, we'll take 15 minutes for questions. Those of you that need to leave, we understand. But I'm going to take a different mic for the questions to be asked. And uh, we'll get this thing to a close. But thank you for being so patient thank and understanding. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to take questions. Anne? Now, let me add something about the Valley Ranch. And what an influence it's had on Cody Wyoming. The play readers groups, book clubs, were all started as a result of people who came from Valley Ranch Hills. That's why Cody is a split skated town. Thank you. Any other questions, or did we cover everything pretty well? I think we're ready to call it a close. Thank you for your patience. And uh, would you like to see another? Oh, we got a question up here. Uh, I'm Jim Nichols, again, Nichols. <clears throat> Almost 15 years old. He flew a whole bunch of us out here for a pack trip and up into Yellowstone Park. <clears throat> 16 redneck South boys, never even been on a horse. So he, in his wisdom, hired Pete to be the babysitter. <laughs> Pete told a lot of stories, just like the phone grab your homes did. <laughs> but I'm going to tell a story that I heard, I've been carrying this around for 70 years as gospel. <laughs> He's going to get a chance to ignore it or confirm it. <laughs> Come on down here. All right. Well, <laughs> It has to do with a particular day in Cody when some boys took a very large tire and filled it with rags. And they took those rags and they took that tire up on a hill somewhere and they soaked all those rags with kerosene. And then they rolled it <clears throat> down the hill. And when it got to the bottom of that hill, it went into the side of a lady's home, which set it afire. So then the fire department came out to that house and so did everybody in town to the fire. And while they were all there, certain boys apparently went down through town and shot out all the street lights. Now, who would make up a story like that? It was the truth. You have the chance to confirm or not. I, I, I got blamed for a lot of things. <laughs> well, they never killed anything. They just destroyed property. I, and then we had to pay for it, too. Yeah. You couldn't have your parents pay for it. I never did get blamed for anything. He ran the getaway car. I drove the getaway car. Let me give you this picture of all the boys on that trip. Phonograph Jones, I think, is in there somewhere. Yes, the phone, you, phonograph was the cook. cook named Paul. Our phonograph, the phonograph was the wrangler. Paul Thompson was the cook. Paul the cook. But Tom, photograph came along to tell stories about him getting yanked out of his sleeping bag and he's happy by fair. This is, this is priceless. <laughs> you earned it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Tim. I, I have to say I want the last word. 
Growing up with these two, I was always the younger one. And when they got in trouble, they turned to their mother and said, not our fault, it's Bob. He's the youngest. So uh, it was always fun to be around them and, and sharing and growing up with them. But they always set a high bar for achievement and being an American. And I'm very proud to be friends with these two young men. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Matt reminded me that Alan has two of his books up at the store that he's written, and some of my books are up there. If you want to pick up a book, uh, please do. Uh, they are up there. And thank you all for being a great part of today. Thank you.